Welcome to Writer to Writer. With me today is Les Standiford, and I am Mary Sue Keppel, the editor of Calliope. Welcome. My pleasure, Mary Sue. So pleased to have you here in Jacksonville. We'd like to talk today about your writing, and um, before we get into your writing, though, would you tell us a little bit about your background? How did you become a writer? Well, I was always a reader when I was a kid, and it was like, I, I feel like I was, it struck me when I saw, read a good book, the Oz books, let's say, that, that first struck me, like a kid who went to the magic show and mm -hmm. wanted to be the one that got to saw the pretty lady in half. I, that's just how amazing I thought books were. They were magical, they took me to other places, and that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to become a writer. I never thought it would be uh, a major part of my life. I thought it would be something that I did in the uh, evening after I came home from my day job, or like William Carlos Williams scribbling mm -hmm. a a poem on the back of a prescription pad. But you, you went the way of the student to the writer? I tried to do a number of things. I went to law school, I went to uh, uh, graduate school in social psychology. I'd started off life in the Air Force Academy. I, uh, I tried to work in the business world. I, uh, you could say I failed at a lot of things before I finally realized uh, fell into uh, into writing. I talked my way into a graduate class in creative writing at Ohio State University taught by a man named Robert Canzanieri while I was in psychology graduate school and I was saved. What did he see in you? I don't know. You'd have to ask him, but uh, I do remember that he was kind enough to encourage me, suggest that I keep after this. I often think of that example when I'm talking to students of my own. What on earth if he had said, forget it, pal, you don't have a future in this. But he was encouraging, and I wanted to take another course. It was coming up summer, and he said, we don't have any more uh, courses in the summer. I said, well, what can I do? And he said, well, why don't you go to a summer writer's conference? I said, well, what's that? Sounds great. And he explained, and I said, well, where? And he took me up to his office and showed me all these flyers, and I picked one in the universe, at the University of Utah. And at the end of the, and George Garrett was there, John Frederick Nims, and mm -hmm. uh, William Eastlake, and at the end, uh, Harry Mark Petrakis, and at the end of it, I thought it was just wonderful. I saw and listened to George Garrett, and I said, I, I want his life, I want to be George Garrett. And at the end of the, uh, uh, the two weeks, the, uh, they offered me a, a fellowship a teaching assistantship in creative writing at the University of Utah. I went, uh, you mean you'll pay me to go to college? And uh, they said, well, yeah, that's the way it works. You do a little teaching. And, hey, I went down and I bought myself a Labrador retriever, found myself an apartment on the avenues, and uh, I've never looked back. I was finally happy. Well, you started out, as I understand, writing poetry. The very yeah. first thing I ever published was a, was a poem yeah. in the Beloit Poetry Journal. Now, what does poetry have to do with the kind of writing that you're doing now, which is, how would you describe your writing now? Well, you know, I just read a review of uh, this, uh, this book that I've just published called Havana Run, which is a thriller, and it's uh -huh. set in Havana. And it's uh, about a building contractor who gets crossways uh, with Cuban politics, and it's about the last thing, I suppose, you'd think that would have to do with poetry, but uh, one of the reviews uh, that I read over the weekend talked about the odd poetry of, this, of the scenes of violence uh, and action. And I thought, well, good, good for him. Because when I'm writing a scene like that, I'm really trying to choreograph it in a, in a way that, that, the, that makes that the language is interesting. So that when you read something that happens that may be brutal, that may be violent, uh, that I'm trying to bring something to it that uh, that goes beyond the the old kapow, bing bang bomb of the uh, of the typical action thriller, let's say, or the comic book approach uh, to to such material. So I'm trying to get at uh, something beneath the action in in these stories, and I think it's my understanding of of poetry that that helps me which in really adds richness to what it is that you're writing. Well, I'd like to think so. How do you teach students? Uh, you're a teacher. You have an MFA program. You're a director of that program, I understand. How do you teach students to bring those depths into a whodunit story? Well, uh, first of all, I'm, I don't 
try to tell students what to write to begin with. If someone comes along who's interested in the, the thriller, which has a rich literary heritage sure. in American and Western literature, going all the way back to Wilkie Collins and uh, Edgar Allan Poe and mm -hmm. uh, Dashiell Hammett, uh, sure. uh, you know, and on and on. It is, I think, a literary form. And uh, if a student comes in sort of attuned and, and wants to do that sort of thing, why, then I, I try to help and, and then I talk directly about my own experience. But usually it's natural mm -hmm. uh, to try to tell somebody, well, you know, if you're going to write mysteries, you ought to try to make them poetic thrillers. Uh, <laughs> they, they'd think you were crazy. I think that that grows out of the the writer herself or himself. It, it's either there or it isn't. If you see it, then you try to encourage it. So there's no cookbook approach to it, of course. Well, what do you do then as a teacher when you teach thriller writing? I've never taught thriller writing. Oh, percent. okay. <laughs> uh, I happen to be a, a writer of thrillers as well as a, of other things, but uh, uh, when I teach, when I'm teaching a fiction workshop, uh, I'm teaching a workshop in the writing of fiction with a capital F. And maybe another thing I should say is that I don't see, I don't hold with a distinct, distinction between genre fiction and let's say literary fiction. I don't think there is anything, uh, I don't buy into that distinction between high road and, and low road. Uh, to mm -hmm. me there are well written books and then there are poorly written books. Mm -hmm. There are poorly written mysteries and there are uh, poorly written uh, books about somebody's grandmother and uh, and good ones in both those categories. And what I try to talk to my students about is the writing of the best possible kind of fiction regardless of the genre, regardless of the, the so-called type. And as a result, uh, you get students like Dennis Lehane uh, who by anyone's accounts may write mysteries but is an excellent writer as well. Then I've had uh, students uh, like Marjorie Klein and Richard Blanco, poets and, and writers of what you know main, mainstream fiction as well, mm -hmm. and that's what I uh, teach them. What they do with those techniques, mm -hmm. and these are techniques that are common to all fiction, to all fiction of quality. It's pretty much up to them. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, in your in your MFA programs, there wouldn't be a class in thriller writing or a class in another kind of a genre writing. It's basically major techniques for all fiction. That's correct. Tell me, this is a question that I'm dying to ask and maybe you won't answer it, but you can read a Harlequin romance and people teach you what the structure is, the form that goes underneath it. Well, they're terribly formulaic and right. people uh, who read uh, uh, them read them because that formula is going to be... Is appealing to uh, 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 Because that's what they want, but uh, it wouldn't be something that I would want to teach. Right, but I wanted to move that one question up into another category, which would be when a person goes into a thriller then or into a kind of a mystery, that's another kind of story where there's a building block that, ha that makes it very different from other kinds of, of fiction. Well, I, yes and no, in my opinion. Uh, as I point out to my students, and I sometimes talk about this because they'll ask mm -hmm. the, the same questions quite often, uh, and I'll point out that, well, the Great Gatsby mm -hmm. is structured as a classic mystery, right. appealing the onion story. The detective in The Great Gatsby is Nick Carraway. He's trying to solve the mystery, answer the question of who this mysterious character, uh, Jay Gatsby, really is. And he peels away layers and layers and layers until finally, at the end, he discovers uh, the truth behind this facade that Gatsby has maintained. And here's a novel that's full of sex and violence and ends in a shootout uh, and murder uh, and uh, in the same way pretty much that Chinatown uh, does. And uh, there really isn't any difference worth a hill of beans to talk about in terms of the form or the shape of The Great Gatsby and, and Chinatown. They're both wonderfully done works uh, of art. Uh, Moby Dick is a, is a rousing sea adventure in its shape, uh, in mm -hmm. the shape of its story. What uh, I try to get students to understand is that most any work of fiction worth its salt tells a story beginning, middle, and end. And we can look at Moby Dick, we can look at Great Gatsby and, and other 
uh, classic examples uh, mm -hmm. in American literature and see how they and uh, Dashiell Hammett uh, and, uh, and Dennis Lehane and James Crumley all share this similar formal aspect. And no matter what kind of uh, book they're going to write, what kind of story they want to write, they have to come to understand as well as how to shape, how to make a shapely sentence, how to fashion a shapely story. It was something that when I was in graduate school got paid very little attention to because I was, this was the 60s, and anything that sounds smacked of rules uh, didn't get talked about very much on college mm -hmm. campuses. Uh, so uh, I've become, I have to admit, pretty passionate about how to plot. Uh, but every good book uh, has, uh, just about every good book has a plot. Well, I do teach that. You do teach the I plot. do teach plotting. Talk to, talk us, to us about that for just a minute or two. Well, plot springs off some pretty uh, basic uh, questions. Uh, I, I tell my students, they, they, if, they answer a, if they can answer a series of pretty simple questions about their story, as far as I'm concerned, they're off to the races. And they go like this. There are five of them. Who is my main character? That means, why am I interested in that person? They have to ask themselves. The second question, what does that person want? Because if a person doesn't want anything, then there's no tension. If there's no tension in the story, there's no interest. If you're writing about a story who has a, about somebody who has a happy life and has no wants, there's no story. As the old newspaper editor says, only trouble is interesting. What obstacles are in the way of the satisfaction of that want? Or, you know, there's uh, corollaries to this, uh, to the escaping of some trouble. What are the obstacles? Mm -hmm. There have to be a series of them. Aristotle talked about rising action uh, along mm -hmm. the way, mm -hmm. leading up to a crisis where the matter is, how is the matter resolved? That's question four. Uh, and uh, in any good story, it has to be resolved one way or another by the actions of the character, not by the appearance of the, some deus ex machina or, or uh, the cavalry coming to the rescue. And the fifth question and the most important question is, why will anybody besides me care about any of that in the first place? Mm -hmm. Why is that going to be mm -hmm. interesting? Mm -hmm. There they are. Who's my main character? What does he or she want? What obstacles get in the way? How is uh, it all going to turn out by dint of what uh, character quality is it all uh, going to turn out? And five, why will anybody care about any, any of this in the first place? If you can answer those five questions, you've really outlined yourself uh, not only a story, but a story that's going to be compelling uh, to, to other people, that other people are going to want uh, to read. And that, those questions apply to the writing of any kind of fiction under the sun. Uh, this, to this I hold. You're saying some really important things because the majority of people who are going to be watching this are interested in the, in the skeleton of how writers work when they put together a, a, a piece of fiction. Well, I think or this even is... Non I think this is all uh, interesting to, uh, as well to readers yes. uh, who can ask themselves, uh, oh, so that's why I like that book. Yes. Uh, let me apply. These are, these are questions that readers can apply to books uh, and test me on this to see if this <laughs> is true. I understand that you've been working when, in, when in Hollywood or with Hollywood. Some of this uh, first occurred to me as I was doing screenwriting, where in Hollywood, uh, the plot is the first thing they want to talk about, mm -hmm. the story uh, line, the structure of a piece. Screenplays, as William Goldman said in one of his essays, are structure. That's, that's what they are primarily. And if you don't have a structure, it doesn't matter. Nothing else really matters. That's what propels a screen story along. Now, obviously, novels and short stories are richer in the way they unfold than screenplays are. You have access to the inner life in, in uh, fiction in a way that you don't on screen, where you're limited to what a character says and what he or she does. But it's very difficult to get what he or she thinks into a screen uh, play story as film. Much easier, however, on, on the page. So, Ips, there, therefore, any story or any novel is going to be richer than, than a screenplay. And uh, uh, so 
this uh, coming to understand this it allows you to, to realize, oh, I don't have to realize, I don't, I don't have to worry that I'm going to uh, be dumbing down my fiction. It naturally will be more rich than a screenplay, but I can steal their idea, mm -hmm. their approach. I can learn something from how the movies do it that's going to be of uh, value to me as a novelist. And the other thing uh, about studying screenplays to come to understand plot or structure is that they are thin. Yeah. Elmore Leonard once said, a novel is to the screenplay adapted from it as the ox is to the bullion cube. Uh, that, <laughs> that's just about uh, you know, uh, the difference between the two. But that's also what makes them easy to study. You can yeah. hold a screenplay, everything that happens in a screenplay yeah. in your head. They unfold in a couple of hours or 90 minutes. And so you can remember everything that happens uh, in a screenplay and say, oh, I see how A leads to B leads to C and uh, how all these questions come into play. Oh, I get it. Whereas even the shortest novel, uh, let's say something like The Great Gatsby, which is really quite thin as novels go, to try to hold in your mind all the wonderful, rich things that happen in that book, it takes you a couple, three days to get through that. You, you read a novel, or I mean, a, you watch a screenplay in two hours. Mm -hmm. And that's indicative of the ease with which you can use movies as a study tool, as it were, for the writing of fiction. Have you actually written a screenplay? Oh, yes. You have? Yes, I have. Mm -hmm. For your uh, own books? I uh, adapted my novel Spill for the screen, right. and uh, I'd like to tell you that, uh, that it was successful, but even though I adapted my own book, it was a terrible movie. Watching it would be like staring into the sun for 106 minutes. Wow. Uh, I, I think you're being modest. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> it was fun, and I learned an awful lot, uh, and uh, it was... Uh, all the people in Hollywood, uh, just about everyone that I've met, these are not bad people. No, they just no, do different not. things. They do different things. Could we move just a little bit to nonfiction? Because I know that you also do nonfiction. Um, a Flagler book, the railroad book. It was um, an interesting step aside from what I normally do. Uh -huh. uh, it's called The Last Train to Paradise. Mm -hmm. uh, the spectacular uh, Henry Flagler and the spectacular rise and fall of the railroad that crossed an ocean. And if you read that subtitle, I'm not sure you even have I'm to read the book. You're right. But uh, it tells you everything that's there. But uh, this is a story that's principally about uh, a gilded age titan, Henry Morrison Flagler, and a, a, uh, a partner of John D. Rockefeller in the founding of Standard Oil, building a railroad from Miami to Key West. It's uh, material that uh, Florida residents may be familiar in a vague way, mm -hmm. had been written about before. But what I said to uh, myself was, this is a fantastic story about a man who wants to do an amazing thing. There are m many obstacles in the way, including three hurricanes and a fourth that washed it all away. And he built a 153-mile railroad across the ocean to the largest city in the, in the state at that time. I'm going to write that story. And furthermore, I'm going to write that story as if it were a novel, right. even though I'm not going to make anything up. And so I used uh, the principles that I talked to you about in, in fashioning that, that piece of non, nonfiction. That's what I thought you did. Now, can you talk about that a little bit? Because I read the first chapter, and I thought, this is a novel. Yeah, but it's all true. And there doesn't have to, what I learned uh, at first, I wasn't sure that I, how I was going to approach it. Did all this research and mounds of material. What am I going to do with it all? And how am I going to make this interesting? And I sat, and I sat, and I finally said, well, less tell the story. Mm -hmm. And the main character was Henry Flagler, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the thing that he wanted to do was to build this railroad, and the obstacles were aplenty, and it got there. That's how, for a while, it lasted from 1912 till mm -hmm. 1935, when the worst storm in history uh, ever to strike the U.S. shores blew it all away. And uh, when I looked at this material in that way, I said, oh, well, of course. Well, of course, only a fool would try to do anything different with it. So I sat down, and uh, with uh, the only thing different about writing history is that you uh, have to find the facts that support your story. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the facts, then you have to go out and do more research to support the story. If you need a fact in a novel, you just make it up. Yeah. But you can't do that, of course, as a, an historian. And if you can't find the fact, then you have to change your story uh, a bit. And where did you go to find these facts? I went to uh, 
the newspapers. I went to books of history that had been uh, published about aspects of Flagler and his life in the project before. I went to the Henry Morrison Flagler Museum, wonderful museum in Palm Beach, where they not only a, a, an amazing house that Flagler built there, 55 room mansion, but also a working museum where Flagler's diaries and the diaries of his men and correspondence back and forth, and I took all these notes and eventually uh, assimilated this material into that story. Did you do any oral history work? I uh, interviewed, one of the most interesting interviews I did was with a man named uh, Russell, and uh, his, uh, Bernard Russell, in his 80s, one of the last living survivors of the hurricane, the Labor Day hurricane, of 1935 that destroyed the railroad. There were 74 members of the Russell family living in the Middle Keys the night that storm swept ashore. 63 of them died that night. And he was 17 at the time, and it was his job to go out and identify the remains, those that could be found. Uh, this, we're talking about a tidal wave of 20 feet sweeping across islands about seven feet above sea level. So some of them never were uh, discovered. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. that, of course, to me was a fascinating experience yeah. to talk to this man who, by the way, was not embittered by the experience. And uh, uh, I asked him, why not? Uh, there was some blame laid to uh, why didn't a rescue train get down the line quicker to take people out and so forth. He said, hey, when the worst thing that's ever happened uh, happens, how can anybody be prepared mm -hmm. for it? Remarkable. He did a couple of tours of, of duty and then came back and became a member of the uh, 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 Red Cross there in the Keys and worked the rest of his life trying to make sure that nothing like that ever happened to other mm -hmm. people uh, mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. What I find interesting is the way in which you've taken the, the power of the novel, the structure of the novel, put it into your nonfiction. As you work with other pieces, do you think you're going to go the, the route of nonfiction more frequently? Because well, I know you have many novels. I'm, I'm working on a book right now called Meet You in Hell about Andrew Carnegie and Henry uh -huh. Clay Frick and the Homestead Steel Strike of 1892, which was the bloodiest labor battle in, a, in history. And uh, it's, I'm, I'm doing research, but I, I'm seeing this story unfold uh, before my eyes as, mm -hmm. as I do it. And it's very, it's, it's interesting, fascinating. I'm learning something, and uh, it's, you like to grow and, uh, as a writer. And uh, geez, uh, here's a whole new avenue of career development <laughs> unfolding before me as I speak. Sounds wonderful. How many novels have you got to your name at this point? Ten. Ten. What's your favorite? It's sort of like asking uh, somebody with a lot of kids what their favorite that. child is. Uh, I have a soft spot for the first one because, hey, that got me into this game. But I think the most recent is the best. You'd like to think that uh, the most recent book is, is the best book. You have a series going. It's about a South Florida building contractor, the last South, uh, honest building contractor in South Florida is the joke among my friends, and uh, John Deal is mm -hmm. his name, and he uh, has uh, provided the impetus. They're Hitchcock-like stories. An ordinary guy steps into the path of the wrong people, mm -hmm. and this has happened to him eight times now. Havana Run is the most recent one, and mm -hmm. he ends up, uh, guess where, uh, in Cuba, mm -hmm. uh, and in, in the midst of Cuban politics. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. He's a guy with no great interest in those regards, but develops them over the course of what uh, befalls him in, in, in the book. We only have a few minutes left, and I guess what I'm going to ask you is, is the, the question that a lot of people want to know, and that is, what are your hints for writers? Well, my hints uh, for writers, uh, the first thing I would say, and I try to let my students uh, know, that this is a difficult uh, game if you're wanting to be a writer uh, for reasons of fame or fortune, forget it. Uh, you know, except in rare instances, that, that just isn't uh, going to happen. The only reason to do this thing is for the satisfaction that the doing of it itself gives you. The pleasure you feel at the end of a good day's work when you know you've met your own expectations. As to uh, whether or not you'll ever succeed, uh, I tell people, hey, success in writing is 25% talent, 25% hard work, 25% persistence, and 25% luck. Mm. 
And if you don't believe me, take a look at the New York Times bestseller list any given Sunday, and you can see, hey, there are some people on here that seem to be talented and others that seem to be lucky. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I think that's the truth of it. Kind way to say that. If you have uh, one more minute left, how, tell us how you write. I take my kids to school. I sit down in front, park myself in, the, in front of the word processor, and I type. I put uh -huh. my fingers on the keys. And sometimes the fingers don't move. But I'll tell you what, you can't wait for inspiration. You have to park yourself in that workroom. Inspiration, as one writer said, is more likely to arise in the workroom than anywhere else in the world. And some days the words come more easily than others. But if you don't set aside some time, if you don't make yourself a schedule on a regular basis, it's never going to happen. I really thank you for being with us. Thank you for all those wonderful things that you shared with us today. With me has Thank been you. Les Standiford, wonderful writer, interesting person. I am Mary Sue Keppel, editor of Calliope. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm.